I think we're in for a really uh, fascinating evening. We're, we're gathered till uh, 20 to 8 at the latest. Um, those of you who know me will know that I, um, it, I like keeping to time in meetings. Um, and an hour and 40 minutes on Zoom is, um, is long enough. So I do <laughs> promise you that we will, uh, we will keep to time. Uh, and you can, you can put your tea in the oven for it to come out at 20 to 8. And I promise you, you'll be able to uh, eat it. Um, uh, we're going to reflect tonight um, on, on um, building better and, and building beautiful. And I, I think for me, it, it's one of the key themes about who we're called to be uh, as, uh, as, as, as people, as people living in community. Um, I, I, I would like to tell you that I have read all 192 pages of the report in absolute detail. Um, I would be slightly lying if I said that was the case. <laughs> Um, but but I think um, but I but I have looked at and it and it really deserves a good looking at and and good reflection upon. There is real wisdom in the report, and I am looking forward um, enormously uh, uh, to uh, to hearing. Um, if you if you haven't if you haven't looked at it, um, just a summary and and the opening uh, the opening proposals. And then that's explored in more detail throughout the rest of the port. It is, is really great stuff to look at as we think. Um, and, and I see they're using some of the words um, which, which I would want to use as well. It, it's how we build houses and it's how houses become homes and how homes together build to form a community in which we live. For me, it's that journey from houses to homes to community that this evening is uh, all about. Uh, really grateful that we have got uh, Dale and Charlie uh, with us, uh, and um, I'm going to pass over now to Gail, who's going to uh, tell us uh, a little bit about the report. Gail, sorry you've been having so many uh, te technical problems, but we're really looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you so much, Bishop Robert. What I'm going to do actually is let Charlie start, and um, I'll come in behind him and, and give you um, an overview of where the Building Beautiful Commission sits. But Charlie, you 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 um, start off first. Um, thank you, Gail. Uh, Catherine, I've I've got a note saying host disabled participant screen sharing. I don't know if that's something you're able to uh, enable. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Wonderful. Right. Um, so I have my stopwatch on, conscious of uh, Bishop Roberts' uh, comment there. Don't worry, I'll, I'll make it. I'll make it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, hopefully, if I can, can you see that? Okay, now we can. Wonderful. Um, well, so thank you. Uh, Bishop Robert, uh, Chris, and everyone for hosting us this evening. It's a real privilege and an honour. Um, we've got a hopefully short agenda, um, thinking of your, your time. Um, uh, Gail is going to introduce uh, the work of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. Uh, it's been 10 minutes to do that. I've got uh, 15 minutes to uh, summarise some of the research findings that, that, that Knight Frank contributed uh, to the evidence base. And then um, we're going to touch for the last 10 minutes on, a, on an, an initiative that has followed uh, the recommendations of the Commission. Um, uh, Gail, the learned one with all the books behind her, do you want to just introduce yourself quickly, Gail? Okay, so Charlie, thank you very much. And thank you, Bishop Robert and Chris and everybody who's given us the chance to talk this through. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you this evening and for us to have the chance to um, talk through what we feel is a really important agenda, given so much that communities and individuals are, um, you know, are facing at the moment. Um, this drives right to the heart of actually how we live and you know, how we will live in future. So Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission was set up um, initially under the May government we were um, asked to consider a set of questions around how to deliver on better and more beautiful development and to um, cons uh, and to um, uh, how development sits within the wider countryside. Um, we started our work in January 2019. Roger Scruton, Sir Roger Scruton, the late um, professor of uh, aesthetic um, uh, uh, philosophy was our chairman quite controversially so but 
who's a, a great inspiration and very, very fair chairman. And you know, a lot of the quality of the findings owe the, a, a huge debt of gratitude to his insight and patience and incredible chairmanship. Um, I was one of four commissioners. We spent nine months taking very extensive evidence, um, searching our expertise, of which Charlie was um, prevailed upon to um, draw up some quite extensive research for us and visiting projects across the country, some good, some bad, and learning from what we, um, what we heard and from what we saw. Um, and so in the course of that work, um, the, the, the principal, Charlie, should we, um, just to, to outline the, the specific challenges we've been asked to look at, um, the obvious central one was how we could positively address the housing crisis and look at ways that we could secure better, more beautiful development, but development with popular consent rather than development that's constantly um, argued about and resisted. Um, we uh, were asked to look at you know, what might constitute the right development in the right place, and that was with the sensitivity to countryside issues and rising concerns about climate change and biodiversity. Um, how the urban footprint needs to change to um, uh, reinvigorate our towns and cities, but also to create healthy places and to enable people to lead um, more walkable, more balanced kind of lifestyle. Of course, that's all now come right up the agenda with COVID and, um, and how we've all had to adapt over the last three or more months. Um, uh, and then finally, the question of levelling up, how all of this could be refocus to help the, the question of how we create a more equitable um, economic um, uh, settlement for the country. So big, um, big agenda and quite a, quite a tough call. So to very quickly, um, <laughs> to spare you the 140 pages or whatever it is, um, to cut to the chase, our key findings were that we should entitle people to ask for beauty, to feel that it was something in development and and the way that we go about you know our business in the property industry that they should feel that they should be able to ask for and how we embed in policy the ability for local authorities and others involved to be able to deliver upon that so i mean what we got to was that the principle of net gain that's already embedded in the environmental um uh the environment the thinking around the environment bill might be extended into the property world so that we consider how development can deliver net gain across a range of measures for communities. Um, most importantly for this evening, um, we found that stewardship potentially offers some answers to how we can secure the higher quality development outcomes that we would all want to see happen. So moving on, um, a way that we, we tried to characterize that was to move away from what we see as being a, a vicious cycle of development, which at the moment, unfortunately, um, is parasitical in existing areas. The reason for a lot of challenge and controversy about development is the sort of sense of powerlessness communities have in the sense that actually the very stretched infrastructure that communities are possessed of at the moment will be stretched even further. So um, we, we, we also recognized um, within the business cycle, the problem of value being extracted at every turn um, and the creation of value not being to the forefront of, of the proposition. Charlie will get onto that in talking us through how stewardship will work in might work in action. Finally, the sense of lack of agency, the people's you know, desire to feel that they actually have a um, a, 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 a say and um, the ability to influence the areas in which they live and the issues that they're most engaged with. So the hope would be that we'd move from that to what we call the virtuous cycle of regenerative development, where good outcomes are valued in and become part of the business model, where people are involved and you know their knowledge of place and their you know, deep commitment to the place that they live, instead of being turned towards arguing against development is actually brought into the development process. Um, and so all of, as, as a sort of general formula that all the interests involved in development, whether the local authority, the developer, communities become much more aligned um, and um, enabling a much more collaborative process to find ways of, of 
regenerating and developing our settlements. So I mean, just to run you visually through a few slides to show what that might mean. So um, a, a core principle was moving away from um, delivering housing units to um, a political and planning environment where placemaking becomes the central objective. Um, where, Charlie, if we move on to the next image, the kind of single use big box development we see here becomes actually a thing of the past where we move to much more integrated development where communities can be serviced much more locally and where high streets become once again the centre of the way that development takes place so that communities and um, and the surrounding areas that they serve are, you know, can be served much more locally but importantly that businesses business can set up it can take place and that can find a focus within the communities within which we live it's not to say that everybody has to live within a very you know sort of limited range it doesn't preclude um, jobs elsewhere but it just means that daily needs can be serviced on a much more localised basis, obviating the need to always get into the car and to have to travel long distances to, um, to do those things that we need to do. Um, and then moving, moving on, um, our hope would be that that would enable us to protect the countryside, um, but also to create a new settlement between, a renewed settlement, I'd like to say, between country and, and, and town, the urban and the rural, where we have a more symbiotic approach to um, both development, but also how we um, supply ourselves with food and energy, how people are enabled to enjoy countryside and get out and lead active lives. And then finally, that um, if we move on to the next slide, this is a picture of a award-winning development in Norwich, probably one of the first streets that's been built, actually conceived as a street, new street in the last very many years but which also satisfies um, zero carbon it's passive house and it's highly affordable and people um, you know are enabled to live in you know really quite um, quite very attractive you know some might say beautiful accommodation but for money that you know is, is affordable and and that wouldn't that be a great objective of, of at least some of what we're doing um, and so so moving, moving onward, um, just to sort of describe my role on, on the commission, um, I was asked to lead a working group on stewardship that had two faces to it. One was to look at how stewardship could be applied to considering how we move forward with planning. Um, and the second side was um, to describe a new approach to development, what we would think we'd like to cast as an innovative approach, but one which is antecedents and how development came forward for really many centuries up until now, producing some of the best quality urbanism that we recognise today. On the planning front, um, these were the, the sort of main headlines. This all came about through working groups that we ran, partly with the involvement of Fiona Reynolds, who was the um, chief executive of CPRE, then the National Trust, now is the Master of Manual College in Cambridge, which kindly hosted work around this, but where we saw joining up um, a, a much more holistic approach to development essentially was at the heart of it. Whether we win this argument remains to be seen, but I would urge you all to, to back us in proposing back to the government that in order to achieve the planning, the, the, the right minded objectives that they have sitting at the heart of the planning reforms, uh, um, there's actually a, you know, a, a, a big role for stewardship thinking in, in how that can be achieved. And then finally moving on to stewardship development. And the, the, key, the key characteristics of what we recognise as just stewardship, a, a, a new approach to development, essentially um, looking to the longer term to bring land capital and um, the, the expertise that's required into a space that allows us to build, um, build, build better communities, which, which from the outset have the social infrastructure, um, environmental infrastructure, structure built in from the start and the way that we recognised that that could potentially be done was through the creation of a, a, a kite mark um, 
the leveling of the tax playing field between sort of the trading regime and an investment regime um, which which currently favors shorter term um, trading and the institution of, of a long term patient capital fund now Charlie will go through in, in more detail but I hope that gives you um, a, a, a very sort of rapid run through of those uh, heavy duty 140 pages that Bishop Roberts kindly had to, had to look at and um, I'd urge you all to engage with this discussion because I think it's really fundamental to the way that the country builds itself out of the, the very challenging situation we find ourselves in. This is, this is about all of us, about all of our communities and finding ways that what we want for our places, um, the place that we love and the place we work in, to play the full role that, that they, they can and need to in, in working towards um, a, a new way of um, engaging with each other, but engaging with local politics and engaging with development. So thank you so much for the chance to talk this through and over to Charlie for the, um, the, the stewardship research and our initiative that we've set up. Oh, um, thank you, Gail. Um, that's brilliant. Um, and I must say it was an absolute enormous pleasure for me to be involved in the Building Better, Building Beautiful uh, Commission. Um, over the next 15 minutes, I hope to share just some of the key findings that I, I think relate specifically to, 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 to a stewardship approach to development. Um, the Commission asked Knight Frank to lead two strands of research. Um, the first report called Building in Beauty. Uh, this asked the question why, despite seeing a number of projects where it was evident a landowner's involvement had led to a much better outcome, why the lion's share of projects across the country had no landowner involvement? Why do landowners tend to sell and put their land in the hands of house builders? What are the obstacles to those landowners staying involved? And what might government do to better incentivize them or at least neutralize the disincentives? Our second report, Cost and Value, asked the question if it pays to build well. The Commission had witnessed that value premiums could be generated by high quality homes, but also that they cost more. Our research sought to uncover the reality. It looks not just at the value of housing, but also the value of non-residential uses. And we analyzed not just the construction costs, but also the infrastructure costs, and importantly, the impact of time and how different delivery models can engender different behaviors. We were asked to research projects that followed a quality agenda to see if that approach delivered additional value by comparison to other local comparators and to see what obstacles landowners faced along the way. Today, conscious I've only got 15 minutes, I wanted to highlight two key conclusions. First, that a long-term stewardship approach to development engenders a higher quality outcome as well as best consideration. And second, that sustainable developments provide additional value beyond housing that can be captured by a stewardship approach. I hope to illustrate these findings using Poundbury, Great. an urban extension to the west of Dorchester. Poundbury is a project by the Duchy of Cornwall that diligently follows a stewardship approach to development. It's been under development for 25 years now, making, a, making it a fascinating project to study. It has followed a master plan of mixed use, walkable streets that appeal and welcome. It has delivered housing that, in my opinion, feels natural to Dorset. It has provided affordable homes integrated within the community and to an equivalent standard. And turning to the value of private housing at Poundbury, we were able to analyse values over the past 25 years by comparison to Dorchester. Here we can see the new homes values in yellow and their resale values in green, consistently achieving a premium above the average values in Dorchester, the dotted line. The 7% average premium concluded was less than some of the other examples we studied. Um, but one of the reasons suggested was that the Duchy always pushed the architects to design larger homes than they might have done otherwise. 
When we looked into that question, we did indeed find that homes in Poundbury were significantly larger than the comparator by some 44%. But most surprisingly, we did not witness the values expressed on a per square foot basis fall with size. Aside from perhaps penthouses in Mayfair, it is almost always the case that the larger the house, the lower the value per square foot. But Poundbury seemingly achieved the impossible and maintained the price on per square foot basis on larger homes. In the graph, you can see that the trend lines do not drop off significantly as the dwellings increase in size to the right of the chart. The value of land is also how much you can fit on it. And this map of Dorchester shows how Poundbury, shaded here on the western side of Dorchester, was master planned to have a civilized density, less than the historic center, but significantly higher than the sprawling 1960s extensions to Dorchester across the southern and eastern areas. The combination of these three factors, higher pricing per square foot maintained on larger dwelling sizes within a higher density, caused the total value of private homes constructed in a given hectare to be 77% higher than its comparator. But we need to remember that quality does cost more and it was estimated that bill costs were 18% higher than the comparators. Once this higher cost is applied across the larger homes and the greater density, we find that the equivalent costs are in fact 95% higher. But it's the basic residual contribution that's important here. The contribution is sales less costs, which in this case shows that Poundbury delivered 59% more value per hectare than its comparators. And in doing so, we can see that the Dutchies approach was justified and delivered best consideration to the landowner. Whilst this residual comparison might be sufficient justification alone for the Dutchies approach, some might dispute whether this relationship holds in all markets. One part of the strategy that we do believe holds in all markets is the impact of working with so-called SME builders, small and medium-sized builders. Often family-owned local businesses, these thrive on the partnership land structures offered by the duchy within a stewardship model. The SMEs are inherently more flexible on margin, and we estimate that on average, they accept a 7% lower margin than a large national house builder for the same project. The difference between 18 and 25% might not sound a lot, but when scaled up to a project the size of Poundbury, we estimate it can add 60 million pounds to the landowner's receipts. For these reasons, the research suggests that adopting a stewardship approach, building high quality homes and working with smaller, higher quality bespoke builders can offer the best consideration to a landowner. Aside from the value of the residential uses, the Dutchies approach has showed the potential value in nurturing commerce and community. Because of their efforts, there are countless businesses that have started in Poundbury. This did not happen overnight, but it is a stunning statistic that for every house built to date at Poundbury, 1.3 jobs have been created. In the report, we illustrated the non-residential uses within Boundary in Poundbury and compared them to a development of a similar size at Elvetham Heath in Hampshire. Poundbury, more than 40 miles from the nearest motorway and not the obvious place to start a business, is now home to over 200 businesses employing more than 2,300 people. This has been achieved over time because of the long-term stewardship approach by the landowner and by designing a master plan with space for businesses to grow. By contrast, Elvetham Heath, just off the M3 in affluent Hampshire, is home to just three businesses, a supermarket, a pub, and a nursery. This is not to point the finger at Elvetham Heath, which is a well-considered housing development. It is typical of most developments around the country that are doing just enough to satisfy planning requirements and sell homes successfully. But this comparison illustrates the opportunity that all these developments are missing. One is a model for good, sustainable growth. The other is what we seem to accept as sufficiently good quality housing, but with no commerce, minimal community, and high car dependency. The Dutchies approach to creating walkable communities has indeed dramatically reduced car dependency. A study in 2013 showed that 22% of people walk to work and 44% of people travel by sustainable methods. 
this is surely more relevant than ever in a country confronting the impact of COVID-19. Oh, I've gone back, sorry. The research shows that the Dutch East Stewardship approach at Poundbury has manifestly enhanced returns and delivered long-term value for them and the community. So we have to ask ourselves, why don't other house builders follow this approach as a matter of course? Our answer is because when land is sold to house builders, unsurprisingly, the vendor quite reasonably demands the biggest possible payment up front. The moment that happens, the clock starts ticking on the need to achieve a return on the investment in land. A house builder won't want too much cash out at once, so they prefer parcels big enough so that they can outmuscle the smaller builders, but small enough that they can limit their cash out. Parcels of around 150 homes work best for them. Of course, these only take a few years to build out, so there's, a, there's simply insufficient time to reap the benefits of investing in longer term value. Instead, they can maximize profits by cutting costs. And if they can work off lower cost assumptions than others, then they can outbid others for the next parcel of land. And so it goes on. This was nicely illustrated by a letter received by the landowner at Fairford Lees, a development in Aylesbury where the landowner, the Ernest Cook Trust, had a vision for high quality housing within the John Simpson Architects Master Plan. When the House Builder Consortium wrote to them in 1999, they explained that, that all the master plan did was increase their inf infrastructure costs, increase their build costs, and cause a loss of floor area, the result of which would cause them only to be able to offer less than £100,000 per acre, as opposed to a typical service land value approaching half a million pounds per acre. What's interesting to me here is that the house builders never contemplated that there might be a benefit to the, to the additional costs, that the values might actually be higher from building to a better standard. What the research shows us is that the result of selling land is that it focuses the profit motive on short-term outcomes. It has created an entire industry where staff are awarded with greater bonuses if they can cut costs, and it perpetuates the delivery of unambitious, standardized volume house building. An alternative option is that the landowners adopt a stewardship approach and opt not to sell their land. Instead of selling their land, they invite house builders as partners to build on the land within a joint venture or perhaps a building lease structure, but they're sharing in value when it is created at the later stages of the project. The lack of upfront costs allows smaller builders to compete with the national house builders. Only yesterday, we exchanged contracts on a building lease structure for over 400 homes where an SME builder outbid a major, major house builder. But they were only able to do so because the landowner offered a stewardship model with minimal upfront costs. But with both parties sharing in long-term profit, they'll be motivated to maximize long-term value and invest in longer-term placemaking, community building attributes, where reputations matter and where businesses can thrive. In this way, the stewardship approach asks landowners not to sell their land, and in doing so refocuses the profit motive of the house builder towards longer term outcomes that are aligned with the community. House builders are rewarded for building long term value and rewarding for following a more bespoke approach to building high quality homes. We've seen a number of examples that also delivers a more affordable housing. The Blenheim estate, uh, uh, the, their development in Woodstock, uh, believes they're so inextricably linked with the future of, of the Woodstock community that they've elected to offer more affordable homes at greater discounts, in fact a 40% discount rather than the 20% that's required to qualify. Uh, they can only do that because they've adopted a stewardship model over a very long time frame and are seeking to, uh, to main control, maintain ownership of those affordable homes. So, a stewardship approach to development was a clear recommendation of our research, and we believe it is an alternative business model that has the potential to affect impactful change to the wider housing market and will engender better and more beautiful housing. As mentioned earlier, our second report, Building in Beauty, reviewed what the obstacles were to landowners adopting a stewardship approach. We recognise that many will not have the means nor the appetite for additional risk, and therefore there will always be a large market for land de 
delivered through the current model. But for those landowners that have the means and the ability, the biggest obstacles tend to be an interpretation of best consideration guidance, a tax regime that encourages landowners to sell, a lack of long-term infrastructure funding, and the upfront cost burden of planning. The report sets out a series of policy measures designed to remove these obstacles and to allow more landowners to adopt a stewardship approach. As Gail mentioned earlier, these were captured within the recommendations of the Commission. So that's the quick summary of our research. Um, I think we're about on time, so I'm going to kick straight on to, uh, and Gail might want to chip in at various points at, at, at this, but I'm going to kick straight on to uh, talk 10 minutes about what's followed. Um, so, so back back at the onset of the COVID-19 lockdown, so this was just after uh, our reports and the, and the Commission's reports were, were published, uh, Gail and I got together with Ben Bolger, who we mentioned earlier, uh, who works at the Prince's Foundation, um, and we discussed the fear that the Commission's recommendations around stewardship were at risk of being lost in all the noise. We felt the stewardship was the golden nugget of the Commission's work and feared that a government seemingly hell-bent on planning reform might miss its potential. Rather than seeking to control the market with a stick, planning, stewardship promised to be the carrot that could motivate change through harnessing commercial drivers. And so the three of us set about promoting stewardship through what we'd called the Stewardship Initiative. So just to remind ourselves, what do we mean by stewardship? Stewardship is fundamentally an ethic that embodies the responsible management of resources and for looking after society. Landowners have a rational sense of stewardship given their long-term interest in preserving a multi-generational asset. Stewardship is about harnessing that interest in a development context to maximize long-term place potential. It is also about introducing a time horizon where it pays commercially to build well, to build to last. It is also about giving landowners a choice. In the same way that the marshmallow test gave young children the choice between one marshmallow now or two if they're prepared to wait 15 minutes, the stewardship initiative invites landowners to adopt a patient capital approach establishing partnerships with builders to deliver greater value in the long term, turning one marshmallow into two. And importantly, stewardship recognises that land is a precious resource and needs to be released for development wisely and responsibly. Why promote stewardship? As we saw with Poundbury, it is a means to encourage good growth, by which we mean walkable, mixed-use communities where lives and livelihoods thrive. The choice not to realise upfront land value also reduces land financing costs, which provides a landscape for smaller builders to compete with the nationals and in doing so potentially rebalances the market's capacity to deliver. Fewer finance costs will also make the whole project more viable, unlocking projects in some marginal locations, but always offering the potential for more affordable homes and a greater investment in community over the longer term. Finally, if all parties are aligned in building long-term societal value, then everyone's interests are aligned. And perhaps we have created what Gail described earlier as a virtuous cycle of development. The Stewardship Initiative has developed the Commission's recommendations into deliverable policy measures that require minimal government intervention or legislation. We have proposed three key measures that support stewardship and which are unlocked by a landowner signing up to a, a project to a stewardship kite mark. As Gail mentioned earlier, this is a set of standards that will bind the project and its participants. The standards relate to delivery models, design process and quality commitments. In return for adopting stewardship, through the kite mark, a project will obtain support to overcome the key obstacles to stewardship. First, an investment fund that would finance infrastructure commitments over the long term at attractive interest rates. Second, a structure to minimise planning cost and risk. 
Cornwall Council is seeking to offer the Duchy a local development order, an LDO, for its project at Nans Ledden in Newquay. I think they're the first private landowner to be offered that. It would make the process of obtaining detailed planning commissions quicker and more efficient for everyone. This right was earned out of trust in the way that the duchy has performed over the longer term. But the kite mark would be a means to earn that trust through contract. Third, an investment trust would offer a tax wrapper akin to a, to a REIT or, or an ISA perhaps that would form a consistent and predictable tax framework for these projects to operate within. The combination of these, we're confident that these measures would be sufficient to encourage large numbers of landowners to come forward and adopt stewardship. However, uh, the risk is as far as the government were concerned, apart from the duchy and maybe a handful of other shining lights, the appetite for stewardship could be limited. Uh, we were confident that the different that the, the that there were this, this large cohort of landowners out there. And so we set about identifying one project in every county of the country uh, to, to identify landowners that would adopt stewardship in return for these measures. Gail, Ben and I set about our telephones for about three or four weeks and we had an overwhelming response. Uh, this map illustrates the response we had and in total, projects that could, could deliver approximately 165,000 homes or more came forward with soft commitments to support stewardship. And this is potentially just scratching the surface and reflected just the three of us. What might happen if major landowners covering multiple sites would come forward in support? What might happen if the public sector estate, for example, received guidance that they believe best consideration could be achieved through stewardship? But here, we were able to demonstrate that the, the raw material existed and we had a set of policy proposals alongside the raw material that was a rare thing in politics. We've made good progress over recent months uh, and we've been fortunate to have the support indicated by a number of MPs who are minded to establish a stewardship all party parliamentary group. We've had the support of a number of key lobbying bodies that have indicated a desire to form a stewardship coalition to promote this policy change. Uh, the SME building community is coming together with a unified voice in support of the measures. Earlier this month, Gail and Ben took Robert Jenrick, our Secretary of State from Emirates CLG, down to Nans Ledden, the Duchess uh, uh, project in, in, in Newquay, Cornwall, to bestow the virtues of stewardship and have had meetings with the housing minister where we've also received indications of support. There is still much to do. Uh, and this starts with us forming a community interest company to put it all together. But despite our efforts and the compelling evidence in favor, we should also be mindful. There is a good chance that government will ignore the stewardship initiative in favor of its planning reform agenda. Perhaps we will be successful, uh, but perhaps even if we weren't, stewardship can thrive without the additional policy support. This would require landowners that do have stewardship in their DNA to be the early adopters. And even in the absence of policy support, we believe there, are su there is sufficient evidence in our research to encourage many landowners to lead the way. Private landowners are able to make personal choices and are likely to be, and are likely to be the early adopters as we have seen with examples like the Murray Estate in Scotland. Their motivation often lies in their role as custodians of the local community, as referenced here in a quote from Downton Abbey. We've also referred to the potential impact the public sector estate could have, and it is heartwarming to see Scotland and Northern Ireland put stewardship at the heart of their blueprints for a sustainable future. And of course, part of the reason we're here today uh, it's because the church has the ethic of stewardship in its DNA. Uh, at least two of the five marks of mission, tend and treasure, speak directly to stewardship. Um, and I think I've got, a, I've got some examples of stewardship in action, but I think that's probably a good place to pause on, a, on our presentation um, and say thank you so much for, for listening for the last um, half hour, I think that was. 
Charlie Gale, but thank you both uh, so much for, for that. Uh, Charlie, what a, what a gift of a place to, uh, to leave me with. Um, <laughs> I thought that might tee you up. <laughs> yeah, not, not planned. Shall I stop sharing the presentation? Here we go. Oh. There we go. And thank you. I mean, Gail, just so good to hear uh, a bit about the background to the report and some of the things in there, and then to look at an example and then take us through to uh, to, to stewardship. We're going to have a, a, a chance to, to have some conversation in groups uh, in, in a moment. But but I wanted to say, I mean, what, what I hear, it may not be the terms that, that you would have used, but I, what I hear in, in this report is, is you doing some really great theology. I'm, I'm not sure if you set out to do some theology when you were writing the report, but it seems to me that that is exactly what you, you have done. Uh, I, I mean, those three things about asking for beauty, refusing ugliness, and promoting stewardship just seem to me to relate uh, to, to, to the Christian faith, uh, to the theistic faith, uh, as something profound about who we are. Uh, we ask for beauty. Christians believe, the Judeo-Christian uh, belief is that, that God made the world and, and made what, what God saw, and God saw that it was good. And so there should be that expectation of a world uh, which is made to be a place of beauty. And yet, uh, of course, uh, within the Judeo-Christian tradition, we also know the, the truth of the, the fall and that sense we see how uh, ugliness comes into to the world. Um, uh, and, and we know that around it and we can see it in building, we can see it in our communities, we can see the effects of that. So we know what it is that we are made for, but we know also that we, we fail to live up to that. Uh, and then I just love those connections into uh, stewardship. Uh, and that sense of care and of and of redemption, and knowing that it doesn't have to be like this, uh, that that there is a chance for us to get this right, that we don't give up, and that that's that's why the report, as I read it, really kind of makes my heart sing, because it talks of a kind of community that we can form, if, if as, uh, and that circle, I, I love that sense from the, from the vicious to the virtuous circle, and that virtuous circle, which is that, uh, that sense about actually how, uh, how it's homes, it's homes that we, we build, and homes then come and create a community, and we're in that um, for uh, the long term, and if the church knows one thing about anything, it is about being in it for the long term. Uh, the Church of England, with our, our roots back in this country to the year 597, when Augustine um, first came to the, to the country, and that sense about what it is to build community for all people, a community in which all people, uh, or whatever race, creed, colour we may be, are able uh, to live together uh, well. Um, and again, I think in that sense of, um, uh, uh, of God's uh, care and involvement with community, and for Christians, of course, that comes uh, around the incarnation uh, about Jesus Christ coming and making, um, making his home here, um, uh, literally pitching his tent in uh, and putting the tent pegs into the soil of our land, that importance of, of where we live. So I think this report is just full of such great stuff for us to, to reflect upon. Um, I, I did have, sorry to say this girl, I had one issue with the report, uh, which comes um, right towards the end. That's just to prove that I did make it all the way through to the end. Because um, there's that fantastic table where you look at the 45 recommendations that you make. And I think you say something about who's responsible for, for each one. And on the, on the, on the right-hand side, not, not quite the last column, but towards, there's something which says um, about the wider community. And actually, you picked up on, on this when you were talking about, actually, um, we all need together to, we all need to work together to win the argument for this. And I think right across our communities, we have people who, who want good places in which to live. Actually, what do we want for ourselves? 
What do we want for our children, our nephews, our nieces, our friends? We want, we want good places in which uh, we live. But, but if we leave it, if we leave it to others, if we leave it to the politicians, if we, if we leave it uh, to, 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 the, to the councils, then, 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 then it will not happen. We, we as a community need to be clear in saying what it is that we want about the way in which we will use our buildings and our infrastructure and the way in which it integrates with the land in which we live to create good communities to build what is really beautiful what is really beautiful as you you so well pick up in the report not just in terms of our buildings but in terms of the community and the society in which we want to live uh, and as you rightly say, in, in these COVID times, when um, we find ourselves spending much more time at home, that becomes so significantly important. Um, so I, I just sort of say it's really, really great to hear that and, and to be challenged by what you're saying. We, uh, and I think part for me of the, the reason for that the we're meeting this evening is, is so that uh, one, we can encourage each other, we can encourage uh, you um, in this task, and that we can play our part. Um, we're a group of people who come from all sorts of uh, different places here this evening, but we can play our part together to shape the future that we want to see. So we're going to have a, a, a bit of a... a um, the great thing of Zoom, we can go into uh, go into some breakout rooms uh, and um, just have. I think we can have still have fifteen minutes together just to um, <coughs> uh, to respond to uh, what we have heard. Um, so just think about what you've heard, what your response is to that, and to think about what's the part that we can play uh, as we seek indeed. Uh, to build better and to build beautiful. Um, so please, in, in your uh, breakout groups, um, thanks everybody. Well, I hope you had a, a, a good discussions. We've, we've got um, a good 20 minutes or so of uh, plenary. Um, the, the way to do uh, this that I, I found works uh, really well, um, hopefully you're familiar with the chat function. If you're not, if you're on a laptop, if you look towards the bottom of the screen, you will find a chat. If it's not showing, just click on that and you will see what people are saying in the, uh, the chat function, which um, uh, should be either free floating or to your right. Um, really helpful. Do, do, uh, do make comments uh, through that. Um, and uh, I will try and uh, uh, call people um, uh, perhaps to, to pick up on what you said in that. We found that usually works uh, quite uh, well. Um, oh, I'm ever so sorry that you can see, but it's, I'm sorry, Susan, you can see the discussions for discussion, but I'm sure that you had good discussions, come what may. Um, uh, Chris, Chris uh, Beals, I'm just going to come to you. Um, is there anything, um, uh, I, I'm going to give you a minute. <laughs> is there anything that you want to um, uh, pick up on? Chris, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I, I was on mute. Yeah. Just as you were saying that, I had to go and let the dog in from outside. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I was going to give you a, a, a minute. Was there anything you wanted to pick up on? And well, uh, while others put comments into the chat. Um, only an observation that we've got a very good mix of people here tonight. And in my breakout room, I actually had um, somebody from a local authority, somebody from a developer, and two people from Knight Frank. So I was uh, very privileged. Um, and I hope everyone else has had good meetings. I'm getting some good um, observations coming through. And it seems to me that what we're touching on is absolutely at the heart of the future of our country. Because if we can really move in this sort of direction and create not just beautiful places, but sustainable places that are affordable and inclusive, then we're getting towards what we believe we really should be like. So I'm very encouraged, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, you're going to talk to us about the profit motive. Yeah, I think I think the question uh, uh, we were reflecting with a little bit in our breakout group was twofold. The one was a rather obvious thing of, and particularly in this situation, the desperate desire to make money and to make things work, which means that not that greed is good, but 
one just has to be realistic about that driving force but also the challenge of the church where uh, and i think that this was brought in at the end of the presentation the one thing that we as an, an established church have is a huge land bank which gives us power um how do we not abuse that power how do we use that appropriately and properly but also given all that charlie was saying to us that long term it is always better to invest ethically thoughtfully and creatively how do we actually make that case because it will require a relentless investment strategically um you know Poundbury is great, but everyone will say, yeah, but that's the Prince of Wales, so that's fine, isn't it? Because he's got so much um, you know, behind him in doing that anyway, plus he's got all the publicity. That Therefore, there has to be a much bigger push on that. And I'm, I'm asking this not as a cynic, quite the opposite, because I believe in it, as you know, with all of my heart, this is the right thing to do. It's simply, how do we do it in a way where we both use our resources of the church ethically and appropriately and not manipulatively also how do we do it collaboratively in collaboratively and, and coherently that as it were it makes the impact effective that people see oh yeah you're right this is good Tim, Tim, thank you. And uh, uh, really fascinating to read what's coming into the text. So that sense about, in, in a way, about changing, uh, changing culture. Um, uh, 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 Rob, you, you're talking about um, uh, in, engendering a, a new community. Rob, Rob, go on, do, do um, elaborate on that. Yeah. You need to unmute yourself. It's, it's always a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> I, I started typing. <laughs> yeah. I, I was talking about a challenge I was given regarding a garden village proposal outside Thornbury, just north of Bristol, when in the very early days talking to a range of people, one of which was churches together in Thornbury, and they said to me, Rob, well, how will you, you can build homes or whatever, but how will you create a community and a community with the right spirit. And John and I were just discussing that and you can't suddenly say, well, we'll build the houses and there will be a community, but it's about providing the ingredients to create a community from day one. So don't build 400 houses and then think, oh, well, we need to put someone in who can talk to the residents who moved in already. It's about having someone on day one whether, for instance, that's a pioneering minister or whether that's the landowner and developer paying the salary of someone in the, the newly built community hub to, to go out and talk to people. There's, there's different ways of doing it to make sure you capture and harness people's feelings and give them knowledge about where they're living in this new community. But you've got to do it from day one. And I think the stewardship model would allow that to happen. Mm. Thank you. Uh, let me just pursue that. Uh, Andrew Goy, I think I saw you on this somewhere um, uh, earlier on. I just wonder if I could get you to say what you are, um, a little bit about what you are doing. Are you there, Andrew? I am, yes, I'm here. You are, yeah, yeah, because that just really connects nicely to what Rob was saying there. So I was appointed last year as a pioneer minister, a new communities minister. Yeah for two housing developments in the very north of the diocese in Warwickshire. Uh, one of them is a sort of about half built, uh, Meon Vale. Um, the other is the Garden Village, which will be on the Longmaston airfield. And the uh, earthwork, earth moving has started on that, but the first houses aren't expected till next year. The plan is that I will move into one of the first houses on that development to start that, that sort of, uh, to be that presence from the beginning and forming community uh, there. That's good. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Uh, and, um, and, and you really are kind of pioneering for, for, for us and the church, that, that model of how we engage. Because, Rob, you're absolutely right. We know as we look at some of the other places where we have, uh, where, where new estates have been built, it, it's, it's right from the beginning that one needs uh, to be there. Um, uh, Kate, uh, uh, and then um, 
Sim, I hope that's Sim D'Souza, let me come to you, but Kate, let me come to you first, because I think you're asking a really significant question about actually how in all of this, um, we, we help create a society where there's a commitment to the longer term. Uh, I just thought it was worth saying out loud that actually when you look at all of our, our political structures, uh, our commerce structures, then it's, it's all geared towards the short term. So this is properly countercultural, um, and that doesn't make it wrong. I, I absolutely think this is the right thing to do. I suppose I'd like a to-do list. What, what do I need to do as a result of this evening? Okay, so thank you for that. And, it, and I think it is that bit about uh, inevitably, and we have a system which, uh, which Gail, I think you were talking about that. It, it, gives, that, um, uh, it, it gives that sense of the, the short term. And it's how we help that sense of the, the longer uh, term. Um, Sim, um, if I'm, am I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Sim D'Souza. You are, Robert. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I, th I think our group was obviously pro-stewardship, so um, we thought the principle was right. I think we were relatively cynical, cynical about the, the fact that there would be few providers. Uh, I noticed on the chat somebody said they could name a number of them, but they were, oh, we all seem to have disappeared into something. Um, but... The, the reality is to think in the long term means you have to be a long term business, I guess, whether you want to call the church a business. But um, maybe if this is about the church um, leading the way in terms of the land and housing it owns uh, to, to show how it can be done. Um, and in the past, in inner city conurbations, a number of councils would have owned significant amounts of land. And so the question is, is who do you go to apart from uh, the duchy, for example, in terms of landowners who can really make a difference and show how stewardship could work for the long term. But our general feeling was a sense of cynicism, I guess, that um, generally people are there for short term gain. And, and unfortunately, that tends to rule. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think that that real sense of that which we need to challenge. Um, Gail, I, I wonder, or, or, or Charlie, did, does one of you want to respond to that? H how do you think we counter that that culture of cynicism in our society, which will say nothing will ever change and and and, and subvert some of that profit uh, motive? Um, I can't see you on my screen here, but I'm hoping one of you might just respond. Robert, hello. I I um. Oh gosh, I'm just trying oh, to- we can see you, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, just to say, and Charlie is, uh, you know, will come in I'm sure um, with a more professional view on, on this, but I think times that are um, changing, that are, 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 are times of disruption, are times when you can make these arguments and gosh, do we need to. I think that's one of the things that we, we you know, need to take as a good out of what is obviously an unhappy and, and very troubling time for everyone. But um, the, the existing structures, the existing ways of doing business, um, you know, haven't been serving a lot of the purposes that we would want to see served. So, you know, surely actually now is the time for a long hard look to be taken. And when we commissioned Charlie, I was just saying to my breakout group, one of the things that we set as an, a challenge for Knight Frank was to show not just how financial value could flow from um, stewardship and looking at these stewardship schemes in action, but also tr tracing through on quite a systematic basis how community value and a wider um, interpretation of value can um, be seen to be derived from, from these kind of processes. Now, I think that would be you know, something I'd absolutely urge everyone in the conversation to you know, take on is, how, you know, actually, how do we, um, how do we, uh, frame value in society and if we can begin to move to a different definition of value then a lot of these things we've been talking about actually I think will flow. We're seeing it in business, they, you know big businesses like um, Rock who's one of the biggest financial uh, investors in property only in the last couple of weeks has said it's moving to a triple bottom line approach to looking at um, you know, its investments. So um, there is, I mean, there's a momentum building in the, the cynical financial world as, as much as in the kind of um, 
you know, this kind of conversation. No, thank you. And I, I'm sure that's, uh, and that sense of wanting to build coalitions of, of, of common interest across our different groups uh, in society. I, I, I recognize that. Actually, that's one of the great things that Chris is picking up here tonight. Um, lots, lots of people, um, we are hosting it, but, but an invitation for, for people with a common concern to make that difference. And as you say, to, to, to win that argument. Um, Ruth, earlier on in the chat, you were talking about the, the, the effect on some of our poorer communities. And I know that's, that's, um, you know, that's, that's where, uh, that's very close to your, to your heart. Um, Ruth, come back and, 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 and challenge us a bit on that. Mm -hmm. I suppose the challenge for me is the holistic challenge um, that um, some of the bigger issues that have been uncovered by COVID, such as uh, you know, the inequalities um, that we've seen with um, Black Lives Matter and, um, and, and the, the gaps in, in our, um, in, well, with poverty, um, that's the, the, the bottom line. Um, have been really exposed by COVID and the inequality in our communities has been brought to the fore. And you know, I'm in a really inner city place where um, beauty is not a thing. Um, and it has a massive impact upon people's mental health, um, upon their ability to, um, to feel motivated to get out of that poverty, um, not to sink into the crime. Um, that is the easy way to get out. Um, and actually, I think if we as a country really want to tackle inequality of gender, um, race, um, economic, social, you know, you, you keep going, mental health particularly, then you do need to tackle where and how people live. If you don't have green spaces to feast your eyes upon, if you come out to mattresses on corners and litter in streets and homes that are falling down around your, uh, you know, your, your eyes and no safe place to put your children, then you are going to find um, a way out of that. And if it means um, permitting some kind of crime to do that, you will do that. Um, and your mental health will, will be very much poorer for it. So if we want to tackle all of that, you have to tackle the stewardship of land and what gets put on those places. And I'm, I, sorry, I'm getting really passionate and I'm sorry, but it's, it just, I see it every day and I don't know how to stop it. Um, so thank you for all of you for being here, because that means that there are other people who are passionate about it. And I think it's that really important sense of, of building that coalition of those of us who say we want that uh, to be yeah. different. Uh, interesting. I remember I, I cut my teeth in parish ministry on a, um, a, a county council overspill housing estate in, um, in Thurrock. And uh, I remember a conversation with someone from the local planning department there bemoaning the fact that um, there was there was vandalism around the estate uh, and he said of course he said um, he said actually all you want to do is to get out of here as quickly as possible to, to the local residents so, well actually then you've got your answer to the question about why this is happening it's about that long-term uh, investment um, really good that we've got Nick Pollock uh, with us um, from from the duchy um, uh, Nick, do you want to say something to us quickly? And then Rebecca Warren, let me come to you. Yes, yeah, so I, I was just responding to some of the comments earlier about how you build community. And, and I think if you, if you want to build community, you have got to engage with your community where you're looking at doing the housing and ask local people what they think. Because when designers or developers come along, they don't really have a clue about what goes on, what makes, what, what good is locally. And so I think there are two things I'd say is, the stewardship model is really important and it's really important that um, you know where, where people are looking at land whether that's the church or developers that they are encouraged to take a long-term approach and engage in the community but the other thing is that um, there are lots of principles that we can take from what we've heard today because not all land that you might be looking at in your areas will be of this large scale 
but there are some key ingredients about engaging with the community, looking at lands in a more holistic way about, I say, look at lands as a catalyst for building communities. So people are thinking about housing, but that's not the only, only thing you can put into lands. You can put community orchards in, you can put play space in, you can put, um, I don't know, or, or a whole myriad of community assets so that actually the whole community gets to use the land in which housing is put. So that's what I'd leave with you. Nick, thank you. And, and, and um, it was really fascinating to be a conversation with you uh, last week and just reflecting um, through your work on the, uh, the, the, um, the, the Dutch is, is estates and the, the work that you're doing to do that. Uh, and it really joins up for me with those comments, Ruth, that, that, that you were uh, uh, making. Uh, Rachel. Sorry, Bishop Robert, you meant myself, Rebecca? Rebecca, yeah. Rebecca. Rebecca sorry. It's okay. I was I'm nearly Rachel. Rachel. It's fine. It happens I'm a lot. Rachel's in my life, Rebecca. So, <laughs> <it's really good. laughs> so, very um, so um, for, for everyone's benefit, I've got two hats on. I am uh, I work for development industry, um, uh, but I'm also um, I work alongside Andrew um, and Roz in the northernmost part of the diocese um, in Church Matters. Um, mostly on the youth side of things. Um, so what I would say to people, there's been a lot of people which have been great today wanting to do something, which is excellent. My suggestion is, is that um, if you have got a desire um, to get involved, go and speak to your local authority, first of all, because they are the ones who are like the gatekeepers. They're the ones who are going to know what developments are likely to be put forward in the next 15 years. Um, and you can get involved at an early stage. They are not resource strong at the minute. They haven't got a lot of resource and they will be relying more and more on volunteers to help community seeding. The house builders aren't always best place. Some are a lot better than others, believe me. And my last job and the one I'm about to go into are much more focused on community building, putting resource uh, manpower, women power, and actual money into that early stage. But not all are like that, and not all want to be like that, which someone else has said. So you're not always going to get everyone on the same page, sadly. But if you go to the local authority and offer that, you get involved early. A lot of uh, developers will bite your hand off and say, Yes, please sit alongside us and help us seed it, because actually it's to their benefit as well. Because a good community is a place over a longer period of time that people want to come and buy new houses mm. and contribute to that community. So they will, they will on the not always, <laughs> um, but and I know Andrew's had differing experience, but the earlier you get involved, the more power you'll have as well to actually shape what that outcome could be, including um, local groups receiving community assets, whether it's the village centre, um, orchard someone mentioned, many things which local, the developers actually would want to find a home for longer term. Um, I think you'll never get a complete consensus on this. You never do in life. Um, so I think um, to support those who are prepared to work with you, show the best it can be. And the more that you do that, the more the developers see that maybe there is a benefit to them, whether it's their bottom line or the sales rate or whatever it might be. Uh, others actually want to do it for their own good. You know, they do have morals, um, notwithstanding what the general public might think. Um, certainly the ones I've worked for are really pro community building. Um, so um, I just offer that as a suggestion, Bishop Robert. Rebecca, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're, we're coming to a warns uh, a close. I'm really grateful for what's in the the chat, and um, and we will capture that. So, if there's anything that you've not said and you really want to say, can I encourage you to put that into the chat there? So we we capture that for for the end. Um, I, I just wanted to come for kind of three last quick things from. Um, uh, from from those who have been uh, participating, um, uh, Graham, uh, uh, Ch Charlie, can I can I come to you first? Just in a a couple of sentences, having listened to to all of this, I wonder what you uh, want to respond with, uh, Charlie. Let's come to you first, and then Gail, I'll come to you. Well, thank you, Bishop Robert. Um, amazing thoughts, uh, very articulately uh, by all. Um, uh, also, a degree of cynicism, which I think is absolutely natural and appropriate. Um, my, my overarching thought is that people are good. 
And I believe that, you know, a lot of the time people think they're in a fight, whether that's a fight with a, a planning authority or to defend something or a fight for profit. But actually, I believe you give people the right framework uh, to operate with and we can make the best out of every situation, bring communities together. So I just think that that overarching principle that people are all fundamentally good uh, and to avoid conflicts and, and form alignment would be my my, my final thought. Charlie, thank you. Um, uh, Gail, let me come to you and then Chris, I'm going to come to you. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think Charlie's point about um, alignment and, and finding commonality of interest, absolutely right. I mean, the other thing that I would say is make your voice heard. I mean, it's absolutely essential. That's the big one right now because there's a lot of things going on and I think everybody has to, um, you know, be, if you feel strongly about this agenda, please, please, um, both at a local but also at a national level, um, take part in these conversations and um, and 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 make you know make make the government sit up and take notice because I think we have something really worthwhile and and special here that we can move forward. Gail, thank you. Uh, uh, Chris, let me come to come to you. Well, thank you. Brilliant things coming up on the um, chat at the moment and some great stuff that's just been said. I think the things that have struck me have been, first of all, uh, initially the point that Tim made about uh, the church as a landowner actually is in a position of power. So we have great responsibility. And that responsibility is that particularly the Church of England is the established church and therefore the church of the nation and therefore the church for everybody and not just for our congregations or members. Uh, and so the use of our assets is important in that respect. Um, it struck me too that we might consider trying to do things on some of the smaller sites that uh, the church owns, because with smaller sites, with small and medium sized uh, enterprises who we could be involved with, we could perhaps do some things without uh, having to go into great expense and so on. So that's worth exploring. Andrew made um, a very good point, I thought, Andrew Goy, about not leaving it all to the builders. Um, because actually, if we're going to get the kind of holistic communities that we want to create, <clears throat> it's not fair to expect the volume house builders to necessarily have all the skills and resources to be able to do what's needed. What we need is to find a way of ensuring that those things are done. And so the stewardship, long-term thinking, offers us the possibility of doing that. I was very, very struck and moved by what Ruth said about um, you know, the poorer areas, poorer communities. And I live in Hartlepool, which is one of the poorest communities in the country. And we really are struggling. And it's great that we're doing a lot of this thinking about how to create good new communities, but we have also to take account of the existing communities and how they can be rebuilt and refocused mm. and supported and encouraged. The use of community assets, I think is a really good one. And that was made both by Nick and by Rebecca. And um, the opportunity to make sure that community assets are well managed and well run for the benefit of the people who actually are living there. So they have a real stake in that. It's happening, I know, over in um, Sirencester, uh, in the Chesterton development, there's a lot of work going on on that. It's certainly being talked about a lot in uh, the Meon Vale development. I know it's being considered in a number of other places. And so there's a lot of really good stuff already going on. And I think a lot of sharing that should take place on that. And, um, the point that Rebecca did make about going to speak to the local authority um, and getting in as early as possible to help seed new developments, the Diocese of Gloucester has set up at, right at the beginning now a system where we've got um, a number of what we're calling volunteer animateurs, uh, roughly in each local authority area across the diocese. And their role is to build relationships with the planners and the developers and the housing associations and, of course, their local communities and really try and get in at the earliest stages before all the decisions are made and then local communities rise up in arms against something that it's too late to affect. So we're trying to get on the front foot on that. And, of course, by doing so, we then can bring to the table the fact that the church has a huge amount to offer. And we want to offer that for the good of the nation mm. and for the good of our communities. Chris, Chris, thank you. Um, really grateful for that. And 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 your enthusiasm and, and connection have been really great in, in setting in setting tonight together. Um, uh, and one of the things I just want to pick up, actually, Charlie, back to what you were saying, that sense of people being of goodwill and, and common cause. 
one of the really important things we discovered from the uh, seminar that we ran last year, and I think we see it here again tonight, is actually that when we get people from across our communities, from the voluntary sector, um, from, from interest groups, from developers and planners in the same room, those of goodwill, there is actually that sense of, of common cause and enabling those good conversations, which don't happen as much as they should do, it is a really important um, gift that, that we can bring. Uh, and, and Sim, I mean, I think I take it back to what you're saying here in, in the chat about, uh, it is sometimes that sense of helplessness or feeling powerless when housing developments are happening. And I hope that tonight is a bit about uh, us actually recognizing that common endeavor uh, that we share and so we can reverse uh, some of that so uh, my sense from what we've seen from what we've heard uh, I would encourage you to go and and to look at the report the, the report is a real lift your heart moment um, if you just you know from 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 uh, as you go through the executive summary and then into the proposals that sense of asking for beauty uh, refusing uh, ugliness, promoting stewardship, it really says something of what we, what we, what we could be. Uh, and I've heard that in, in, in what we've had here tonight. And, and I know Chris, you and I will look at the, the chat, we'll save the chat, and we'll try and uh, pull that together as, um, as we think about how do we respond to that. And for me, it's that sense about how we build coalitions so that we do indeed build better and, and build beautiful. Thank you. Thank you enormously. Can I say just a huge thank you on our behalf, uh, Gail and Charlie, uh, uh, to you. And, and, and you, get a, you get a virtual round of applause to say thank you um, enormously for giving up your time. Uh, the great thing about Zoom is we can come from, from so many different places uh, uh, together to do this. Um, so thank you, everybody. I do apologise for those who wanted to speak and I didn't call you, uh, and please forgive me for that. But, but what you've said uh, has been got and, and captured. Um, lots of us, different traditions, um, some from the churches, some of faith, uh, all of us of goodwill. Um, let's just keep uh, just a few moments of quiet together uh, as we remember uh, that which we are committed to uh, and... Uh, uh, commit ourselves to that future for which we've been talking tonight. And I want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody for, for being uh, here. Um, and um, it's been a really good discussion. Uh, have a good rest of this evening. Thank you.